Evening, everyone. I hope you're very well. Um, I've been looking forward to this webinar. It's, uh, it's actually been quite good to good fun to put together. And something I, I love about webinars is um, I can put on a smart shirt, but sit, be sitting here in my shorts and uh, in sandals and the, the nice warm South African weather. Um, I want to just start by asking you a couple of things just to I always want to find out who my audience are so let's get to the first first one I haven't set up any polls tonight but there's the Q&A section so just uh, just type into that and let me know who you are Okay, we've got a triathlon coach. Who else? Exercise physiologist, great. Doctor. Sports nutritionist, Simone. Nutritionist. Who else? There's lots more of you. Sports nutritionist, welcome. Okay, Cairo, psychologist. Hi, Gerard. Gerald, Gerard, sorry. Who else have we got? Nutritional therapist and health coach. Excellent. Nutritionist. Okay, cool. Right. All right, so there's a lot of nutrition representation, and uh, we've got Cairo, and we've got exercise physiology as well okay next one is i like to know where you're dialing in from because we sometimes get an international audience so just fire away again london glasgow johannesburg manchester holland Bur bournemouth belgium cardiff essex No Australia's this this time. Okay, next one. What would you like to learn from this webinar? So basically, I'm going to go through the carb fat discussion. That's obviously the main crux of the webinar. Um, but we're also going to look at um, a bit on the course, and then I'll, I'll give you time for Q and A. So just give me a quick description of what you're looking to, why, why did you join this webinar? Hey, you're all shy. Unless I'm looking in the wrong text box. Okay, here we go. Fascinating and controversial topic. Yes, quite. Consideration for special populations such as youth and power athletes hope to gain more insight current research okay so many co conflicting views okay cool right i think that's enough to to kick us off um so i've got one more question um is there solid evidence? Is there solid ev evidence, useful evidence behind low fat versus low carb in relation to sports and training? Okay. Um, right. And one more question for you, just a yes or no. Did you were you on the last webinar I did a month ago? Just so I know if you're familiar with my kind of stuff. Okay, right, so there's a good chunk of you, a few that you haven't, okay. Right, so let's move on. This is the American College of Sports Medicine um, position statement around nutrition. And so we've got one more 
come in. Okay. Okay, Pamela was at the sports nutrition seminar in London last May, so great. Um, okay, so ACSM is uh, very well regarded. They've uh, teamed up with other dietetic organizations and they've been doing this since uh, I think the late 90s. I certainly, the first paper I had was 2000. Um, it's evolved slightly, but it's still very quantitative and a lot of you were on the last webinar, so I've already said this. Um, but it's a way that nutrition um, seems to be sitting still. It is evolving, but we're very much in this quantitative uh, realm of carbs, fats, proteins, macros. So macros has almost become a buzzword, but it's uh, you know it's just it's been our over over focus for many years, and. I decided to sort of bring up the fat and carb discussion because I've got philosophical views on it. As you'll see, the research kind of stacks up for either, and there, there's pluses and minuses. Um, so if you're a diehard researcher who have, has a certain belief, um, you might be pulled in one direction, but then you find uh, things that are contrary to your argument. So. What I'm going to try and do, you know, I don't have time to go into a ton of research, but I'm going to be pulling um, threads together and, and bringing together a discussion of this complexity and the way you should be thinking as practitioners. So I think every single one of you are, are practitioners by the look of the list. So, okay. So let's go into it. So I want to start with just daily diet because I believe that's a fundal, fundamental base. And you've seen my, my performance pyramid uh, before, um, but I've changed it for the, for the purpose of this presentation. So it's only three layers this, uh, this time. Bottom layer, health-based nutrition, then exercise nutrition, and then ergo, uh, ergogenics, I almost said ergonomics, which is slightly different. Um, talking a bit which I'm on an uncomfortable chair. Um, so health-based nutrition, I believe that that is fundamental to any athlete. They might think, yes, in that athletic performance, I need to eat this certain way, but you need to get the health right first. And therefore, general population studies are relevant, I feel, in the selection of a, a diet for an individual, where, whether they're athletic or not. If they are athletic, you come up to this higher layer and start bringing in more exercise specific stuff. Okay, so let's just expand on that. If you came in last time or if you've seen me present at other places, you may well have seen this diagram. Um, I feel in this day and age, we're sitting in black, black and white. So the low carb, high fat era, it's, it's almost like Atkins is, uh, you know, risen from the dead and come back in our thinking again. And it's had a lot of research attention lately. But then you've got the, the low fat, high carb on the other side, which is very much the prevailing dietetic norm in general population and in sports. And it's still hanging on, but you've got people uh, checking out the other side but we're going from one side to another, one side to another. And that's the way research works best because if you make a big enough change in the actual uh, food that you give a subject, you will see sizable changes in results. Subtle changes, it's more difficult to get significant results, which is why we've not seen very much research in this area within the sports market. Um, in general health, you know, Mediterranean and paleo has been well discussed. Um, and Mediterranean's got tons of evidence for health and even mental health. I, I uh, interviewed Hannah Kay in Cape Town uh, last year, and that's her passionate area. So she was talking about the Mediterranean diet and mental health. So why don't we look in the middle a little bit? We're swinging from one side to the, to the other and becoming very confused because black doesn't quite fit all people, then white doesn't quite fit 
every person either. But paleo is not necessarily going to fit everyone. Mediterranean is not going to fit everyone. Vegetarian, vegan is not going to fit everyone. Okay, I just want to, you know, expand on that black-white scenario. A friend of mine, Tom, in Cape Town told me, you know, help me realize that within about a year or so of each other, these two books came out. So you've got The Real Meal Revolution, which is uh, Tim Noakes and colleagues. And that's very much the banting uh, aspect. And that's, that's very much, um, you know, ketogenic, Atkins type stuff. More focus on the fat, less focus on the protein. Um, it's been a big storm here in South Africa, but it's, you know, it's had influence elsewhere as well. Um, over on the right-hand side, you've got the China study revised. Okay, the China study, I think, was 2003. Colin Campbell did a massive study in China and came out with the philosophy that the amount of protein in our diet is directly related to rates of cancer. So that's quite scary. Um, there was a study done in Stellenbosch um, not too long ago and it hasn't been published yet, but um, the findings were they got, how many people was it? There was a decent number of people and they did a seven day dietary record of um, a week, yeah, a week's diet and they'd been following the Banting diet to lose weight, okay? What they found was on average, they were consuming five times the recommended di dietary allowances of protein. I mean, that's absolutely massive. And the odd person was consuming 10 times. Now, think of the kidney stress. Uh, got a colleague, bodybuilder colleague in the UK, Paul Wren, who's going to talk at the, on the course this year. And he did a really lovely article on kidney stress uh, for the FSN magazine. And yeah, you, you have to be cognizant about your protein intake. He was talking about kidney stress. Colin Campbell's talking about cancer. Tim Noakes is talking about fat. But try going on a very high fat, very low carb diet without raising your uh, animal consumption of protein as well. It's quite hard. Okay, so you might have uh, caught on to this. There's the black, there's the white, and this is my preference find your shade of gray and there's more of 50 it's, we need to be individual okay and scatter plots have been used in science for a long long time so the scientists know fully well that we have big ranges of um, people in, in a study but they're generally looking for averages. So when you study up here, low carb, high fat, yes, you'll get some outliers that sit in there. And if you study low carb, um, sorry, low fat, high carb, you'll get some outliers in there. So, you know, it's, it's important um, to recognize that spread. And it's so important to recognize that some people do extremely well on these extremes. Okay, so this is, Average base diet. This is even, isn't even sporting diet yet. Now, this came out, a client of mine shared with this with me a week or two ago. So it's very hot off the press. And it was a massive diet. And uh, my notes are below in the presenter's notes. I think it was 600 odd people uh, were put through a one year trial. And on average, they were losing about 10% weight, um, whether they were on low fat or low carb. But the major change, according to the lead researcher, was it was a whole food diet. They were mindfully engaged in the process of eating better, and they got good results. Okay, And they even brought genetics into this. So you know, I'm a big fan of genetics, but these guys didn't think it seemed to make that much difference. The biggest aspect of losing weight according to this massive study was just engaging in a whole food healthy diet. Whether it's skewed towards high fat, whether it's skewed to uh, high carb. Okay, so quite important. 
And then I like studying groups around the world. I like looking back. I lo like looking at groups of people who are still living the way we, we used to, or our ancestors used to anyway. Um, this is a lovely report that came out uh, a year ago, well, almost to the day. Um, the healthiest hearts in the world, and it was uh, in Bolivia. So people, indigenous people living in the um, Amazonian rainforest. And what did they eat? So about 17% of their diet was wild boar and this uh, indigenous large rodent. 7% was uh, catfish and piranhas out of the, uh, the, the river. Most of the diet came from uh, likes of sweet potatoes and it wasn't bananas, it was plantains. Um, so starchy vegetables and the rest was uh, gathered. So berries, wild berries and, and nuts and so on. And what was the carbohydrate percentage of their diet? Of course, you had some American researchers going in there and translating this information into macros. And it came out that they're eating about 70% of carbohydrate in their diet. So massively high carbohydrate, but there's nothing man-made in there. There's no chips. There's no bread. There's no sweeties. The carbs they're eating are, they, they uh, harvested these, but they're using soil that hasn't been uh, affected. So, and these, they studied their card cardiovascular health and found amazingly good health in these people. And then this tallies up with this uh, landmark book came out about 10 years, no more, 15, 10 to 15 years ago, uh, The Blue Zones, where they looked at different places in the world of uh, the healthiest living people, the, the healthiest centurions. Um, so you've got natural movement, not uh, virgin active and uh, let's see, UK gyms again. Uh, <laughs> David Lloyd leisure and banner times, um, purpose in life, been able to downshift, large amount of plants in the diet, 80% meant uh, eat, a, eat, a, eat, eat until you're 80% full. Wine lovers will love this. They would have wine at five o'clock to mark the end of the day. Uh, there was a lot of be belonging and part of tribe and belief, okay? So I want to just, uh, before I move on to sport specific, uh, I just want to mention intermittent fasting because that's got, again, a lot of uh, research. And I'm not going to go into in huge detail. I'm just going to give you a couple of things that, you know, kind of favor it. So this is intermittent metabolic switching neuroplasticity, which is getting more press at the moment now in brain health. So it found that repeated cycles of a metabolic challenge, so induced ketosis, followed by a recovery period, eating, resting, sleeping, may optimize brain function and resilience through the lifespan. Okay, so that's one. So this is pre-exercise feeding in overweight men, so not quite your elite athletes. Feeding before acute exercise uh, affects post-exercise adipose tissue gene expression. So we propose that feeding is likely to blunt long-term adipose tissue adaptation to regular exercise. So that's, that's all well and good. So I like that. If you go back to the blue zones, if you go to the Amazonian jungle, you're not going to have food every day. You're not going to have your breakfast, lunch, dinner, and two snacks. So I get that very much. But we've got this daily um, pattern now in westernized living called stress and we live in a high cortisol load that is continue continual and one of the most important ways to regulate stress for any of you who have who are into working on adrenal fatigue and, and recovery from is trying to balance blood sugar levels now if your adrenals are already weak or your thyroid's out or you know pituitary isn't firing quite so well, which is quite common. If you start doing intermittent fasting, you're going to put pressure on the, on the person. You're going to put the pressure on the adrenal glands, the thyroid glands, the ones that are actually needing to recover as well. So there's a double-edged sword there with this sort of information. And I like genetics because it gives a bit of individuality aspect to this question. And 
on the question of intermittent fasting, uh, the same friend in Cape Town who told me about these two books being polar opposites of the same, in the same era, um, he's a slim gentleman like myself. Um, he would self-professed and myself self-professed would really struggle with intermittent fasting if you do it too seriously. I will take, um, I'll do a fast occasionally, but short. And just really for the purposes of gut rest, um, so if the gut's a bit uh, funny, you can take half a day off eating or even a whole day, but I would do it on a Sunday when, when life's easy. Um, his brother, my friend's brother, uh, is a very different metabolism. He's a much heavier guy, plenty of weight to lose. And he read out about intermittent fasting, got, tried it, um, did it for a day, <laughs> And it didn't become an intermittent fast. It became a prolonged fast. And I think he went about 30 days without eating. So, of course, people can do that. And he felt great and, and so on and so on. But horses for courses. So this is just an indication of some genetic testing that I do and I like to look at. And it's part of the information I'll bring in with a client. So this particular first case is your stereotypical person who would do well, I think, on a banting or a intermittent fasting kind of approach and or intermittent fasting. So genetically, this is showing that they're low risk or they metabolize saturated fat extremely well, but they metabolize carbohydrates extremely badly. So much more focus on higher fat, lower carbohydrate with this kind of person. But how many times have I actually seen these dials being opposite in five, six, seven years, maybe I've been using this test? Uh, zero. So it doesn't happen very often to that extreme. This is more the, the average. So yes, they have to be a bit careful with saturated fat. They also need to be a bit careful with carbohydrate from a metabolism point of view, from a weight management point of view. And I will argue that health is connected in there as well. Okay, so one, what diet is good for one, um, what dietary balance or micro balance is good for one aspect of health will be also good for other aspects of health, okay? Sorry, I've been ignoring these questions. So let, let me just uh, I'll finish the first section. Um, okay, so sorry, I just saw the Q&A pop up um, and it was just people answering my original questions. Okay, so let's go into the next section. So exercise, nutrition, I'll push on with this because this is the kind of crux and then uh, I'll slow down at the end and, and get questions rolling. Exercise, nutrition. This is the old school carb loading strategy where you firstly exhaust, exhaustive exercise to deplete muscle glycogen, then a low carb intake, then you load carbs for three days and then hit your marathon. You know, the marathon was the, the, the standard thing with the carb, the pasta parties and all that sort of stuff. So that's quite old school. Uh, this is still very old school, 1981. Um, this was a study looking at, okay, there was a mixed diet of 50% carbs all the way through six days. There was 25% carbs, so low carb for three days, high carb for three days, um, and then medium carb for three days, i.e. a more normal diet, and then high carb for three days. And at the same time, they were stripping down their daily training, okay, and then a rest before the, the trial. Muscle biopsies taken on day seven showed no significant difference in muscle glycogen between groups two and three, but both were higher in group one. So it serves to do a carb load, but there wasn't any real benefit of going really low carb uh, on the days before. Okay, and that, that's mostly the prevailing thoughts to today. Though there's still opinion, differences of opinions. And even the excuse me, the modern day carb researchers, and I'll mention uh, James uh, Martin quite often because um, he's done a lot in this area and I've followed some of his work. Uh, 
he will generally agree with most of this. And then here's a, a very up-to-date research study. So let me just move my head for a moment. So fat and carb oxidation rate during 180 minutes, so three hours of running at 64% of VO2 max and two hours of recovery. Okay, so what happened? Okay, so here we've got percentage VO2 um, at peak fat oxidation. So here's a high carb diet, here's a low carb diet. This was Alex Ferretti who shared this paper uh, and it was a ketogenic diet. So a very high, um, very restricted carbohydrate and, and a high fat diet. So you can see peak fat, the, sorry, the pace that somebody can go at becomes significantly higher with fat oxidation, okay? So you'll see a slide in a few, I should have brought it a little bit earlier, but you'll see a slide in a bit uh, showing that you need carbs to hit the higher intensities, but this study showed that uh, a low carb diet actually could increase the intensity of, of exercise where you could do it with fat oxidation, okay? So there's a benefit to that. Then we saw, here's fat oxidation, the blue is the low carb diet. So this is during the exercise and then during recovery. Okay, so a massive increase in fat oxidation. And then here's the, the low carb diet down here. This is carbohydrate oxidation. So there's a definite preferential use of substrate if you are on a ketogenic approach because you don't have much choice. And I don't think this study was carb loaded either. Um, so we, so by doing a low carb diet, it definitely improves fat oxidation, but we could flip over the other way. And there's research is talking about, well, it might actually hurt your carbohydrate oxidation rate. So you don't, you can't change pace so, so well. Okay. Right, here's, this, here's the one I should have brought it up earlier. This is uh, Roger Harris, uh, who did a lecture for me a few years ago, and this is one of his slides. So basically fat, along the x-axis, you've got volume, you've got amount, so there's a lot of fat, but up the y-axis, you've got rate, or ATP flux rate, we call it. So your ATP flux rate for fat is not particularly good, you go into carbohydrates in an aerobic way, you're obviously limited up to VO2 max. It's a lot more than fat. And then to go higher, you need to go into anaerobic metabolism. Okay, so flux rate. Fat is limiting for high intensity exercise. So it brings in the question right now, what is your event? Are you a high intensity athlete? Or are you doing Ironman and comrades and 100 mile trail runs and you know, the likes, because your preparation is uh, quite potentially going to be different. Okay, this is uh, going back in time again. So this is 1986, some uh, famous researchers, uh, Coyle and colleagues, exercise to fatigue at 71% of VO2 peak with, while they're, while they're running, they're either taking a carb solution, which I think was about 6%, solution or placebo and they found that and they were taking that every 20 minutes there was a massive increase in time to exhaustion so average of 180 minutes on placebo up to 240 minutes so that's a whole more hour whole extra hour it's a long it's a nasty trial that one so this is like three hours and this is four hours so but anyway some people have the motivation to do it but it just shows if you're lacking the carbohydrate during, you're going to have a performance decrement. And James Martin uh, has shared very, very similar data to this, looking at a kind of race scenario of endurance performance. So then we get into train low, compete high. So we recognize that racing, doing an event on low carb is not a great idea because you're going to limit your time to exhaustion and your performance. But 
What about training in a low carb state to maximize your fat metabolism and maybe some other stuff and then load up to compete? So that, that came in. This is a very pivotal paper in 2008. So the theory that athletes training in a glycogen depleted state will maximize certain physiological adaptations to exercise and then glycogen load before a race day. Okay, so let's see what they, they talked about. I'll just, int if you're not into genetics, I'll just introduce this transcription factor. Peroxisome proliferator activator receptor. So say that after a few tots and uh, I'll, <laughs> I'll buy you a drink if you get it right. So they increase mitochondrial mass and are increased by exercise. So exercise itself, more towards high intensity, induce the, the, the PGCs to activate, and we'll see what they do in a sec. And then in a, glyc in a glycogen depletion state, um, you stimulate AMPK, which is a stimulator for the PGCs. Okay, so after using all these abbreviations, let's kind of have a look at it. So here's your PGCs, the peroxisome, peroxisome proliferator uh, receptors. They increase mitochondrial mass. It's the primary thing that's been discovered about them. So it's mitochondrial biogenesis, which in turn, if you get more mitochondria in your muscles, increase power velocity uh, lactate threshold. Okay, Andy. Okay, Andy raised his hand, but I can't see. Okay, Andy, ask a question if you got one. Okay, sorry, Andy, I can't. I'm clicking on it, but it's not opening anything. So if you got a question, just fire it into the, the question bar. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Mistake, no worries. Okay, maybe you'll think of a question by the end. Okay, so this is a really, really important um, slide. And it's a, I, I kind of recreated a diagram from their paper. Here's your AMPK, which uh, you'll hear the likes of James Martin talk about a lot. It basically stimulates your PGCs to increase mitochondrial mass. There's MAPK, there's calcium, uh, I can't remember what MK stands for, and then beta adrenergic receptors. So that's your adrenaline. Okay. Metabolic stress, cell stress, calcium, which is released during intensive exercise or any exercise, but obviously you get more in an intensive. Decreased sympathetic nervous system. That's an interesting one because when do we get decreased? Overtraining. So in other words, you stress the body in some way and you stimulate all these pathways which upregulates your PGCs, which upregulates your mitochondrial mass because the body's thinking, well, I'm not really coping with this exercise that uh, my master is giving me. So I'm going to upregulate all these things, make some more mitochondria. And the next time he or she goes out and does that same exercise, I'm going to be better equipped. Okay. So it's kind of logical. Um, so just think metabolic stress. Okay. Right. So we're going to go on. This is looking at AMPK it's a study in 2006. So there's some, some historic, there's nice up-to-date stuff, but there's historic research that actually uh, paves the, the way for this information. We suggest that increased activation of AMPK under conditions of low muscle glycogen enhances AMPK alpha nuclear translocation and increases GLUT4, so we're talking about insulin, Expression and response to exercise in human skeletal muscles. Okay, so low muscle glycogen is a metabolic stressor, so it upregulates these pathways. So, is it best to train in a glycogen depleted state? These studies would tend to suggest yes, it's a good idea. But as we always have to consider, yes, but we have limitations. 
there's yes but all the way through physiology there's yes but all the way through sports science and sports nutrition we always have to ask the but and the what ifs be like i've, I've got a four and a half year old and a two and a half year old and you know it's everything you say is why so <laughs> i think as adults we sometimes forget to ask why and you know, is that really the case? Can we go a bit deeper or ask it a different way? Okay, so limitations to this model. The one really big thing is the perceived exertion of an exercise bout with a matched workload is greater in a glycogen depleted state. It's harder work. If an athlete can, with more glycogen can exercise for longer at higher either exercise longer or exercise more intensively, will the glycogen depleted advantages be offset? That's my question. It's not one I can answer, but it's one I'm asking. So yes, we go low carb, but we can't train as hard. Now, James Morton has a flip question around that. He says, well, you know, if the adaptations I raise the MPK happens after an hour on a low, in a low carb state, whereas you have to work for an hour and a half or you have to work more intensively to get that say, same AMPK in a high carb state. Well, maybe you saved yourself half an hour. So that's another way of thinking. But then I'm a nutritional therapist. What about cortisol? What about inflammatory responses? What about immune stress? In sports nutrition, these words are not held, heard very often, except for immunity, okay? Because we've got a really nice area of exercise immunology. Okay, and you'll see the lead researcher of this paper is called David Neiman. I met him once, once in North Carolina. He's a prolific exercise immunology researcher. And this was 2005, so again, old research because I find a lot of the time we're now in 2018, but we're asking the same questions and we're kind of going around in circles in some ways, but moving on in other ways, okay? So he looked at 15 trained cyclists who cycled for two and a half hours at 60% of maximum watts on two occasions, either with a 6% uh, sugar solution or a placebo. The carbohydrate, when compared to the placebo ingestion, attenuated the increase in plasma, cortisol, epinephrine, or adrenaline, interleukin-6, interleukin-10, and interleukin-1 during exercise. So that was plasma levels. It wasn't repeated in the muscle measurements, but there's quite a lot there. And the big thing for me, well, they're all important, but the stress hormones are higher in a placebo state. In other words, higher when you don't have carbohydrate coming into the body during a, a tough exercise session. And this wasn't actually that tough. 60% is not that high for a trained cyclist. But nonetheless, it, um, you know, especially, so not that hard an intensity, but cortisol and adrenaline are being raised. We want to basically restore our, our athletes. So if you come back to that early pyramid that I drew for you, the base is health. If you're sitting in high cortisol, um, high inflammatory cytokines too long, what's going to happen? Your immune system's going to struggle. And this guy's, you know, researched 20, 30 years in, in the immune system and he shows how very clearly how like marathons and triathlons deplete immune response um, after, you know, afterwards. And then closer to home, we've got Eukendrup and uh, Mike Gleason. Mike Gleason's also a prolific uh, exercise immunology researcher. And they wrote this book. In this book, they talked about consuming carbs during exercise. The cortisol response can be moderated and therefore less protein breakdown. Okay. Elevated cortisol is associated with, sorry, associated with moderate to high intensity exercise, stimulates muscle breakdown, okay? Cortisol, catabolic. Okay, I had a, something flash up there, but I'm struggling to access my menu. 
Mm, I'll get to you in a sec. Okay. Training at low carbs, are athletes more susceptible to infections as well? Potentially. It's, it's a good question, and that, that would require these kind of guys uh, to extend their, their research um, or somebody else. But that's an association. If training with low carbohydrates has an associated in co increased cortisol level, Yes, it would assume a, a bigger susceptibility to infections, but it's harder to train with low, um, low glycogen. So as I'll be coming to, the general suggestions are actually to um, not train high intensity when your glycogens are low. Okay, so this comes to modern day. One of you was uh, excited to get up to up-to-date um, research. We, so I, I host the, what used to be called the Sports Nutrition Live conference in London each year. It's now the ICANN conference, to, which is connected to what used to be CAM. Um, we did have James Morton booked for this year, but unfortunately he's away on, on tour. We've now got Sam Impey, who's, who works for Wigan Cycling. So he's a nutritionist, but he did his PhD under James. Okay. So this is his dissertation, essentially, which has since been published, and he sent me the, the, the full paper. So if anyone wants this paper, just give me a shout. And it was one incredible study. So, okay, so day one, here's the high. Up top, you've got the high-carbohydrate uh, scenario. Down below, you've got the low-carb scenario. They had identified that previously that in a low-carb scenario, it affected protein metabolism. So they added in leucine. So leucine is one of the branched chain amino acids that is linked to mTOR activation and therefore, um, you know, keeping muscle mass. So they were trying to do a low carb environment, but still keep the protein, uh, the protein building capabilities. Uh, okay, how many grams of leucine? I, I'm gonna have. I would have to look at the paper, jo uh, Jocelyn. Um, but yeah, just give me an email and I'll I'll get that to you. But three three grams a day is kind of standard. Um, I think they were yeah by memory they were doing uh, whey and leucine. That's why it's like sitting at 22 grams. Okay, so high environment day one. They, they had carbohydrate intake uh, for an evening meal or they just had basically a whey and leucine drink. Day two, uh, these guys were eating normally. These guys were eating low carb, but with uh, some protein, uh, protein at the standard levels. Day three, they're coming into the lab. Um, these guys are doing carbohydrate for breakfast. These guys are not. They're essentially skipping breakfast and having a whey and leucine drink and then you've got your um your exercise trial <laughs> these don't mean injection of drugs these mean <laughs> blood samples and muscle biopsies so they did the trial um and ah i was hoping um uh, this slide was was having the um the exact the exact trial but it was eventually an exhaustive trial okay so i Again, I'll have to dig back in the details. I, I put notes, but then my notes are in my presenter notes, which are hidden. Um, okay, so these, bases, these guys stayed as glycogen replete as possible. And these guys, you know, avoided carbohydrates all the way through. And then there was a three-hour check-in at the end. Okay, so what did they find? Here's the carb fat effect on exercise. So here's the high carb, here's the low carb with leucine, and then the exercise capacity, which was measured in minutes. So it ended in a time to exhaustion type scenario. And on average, the, it was like that previous study I kind of showed you, you know, 50% greater time to exhaustion kind of scale. So it was a big difference, but there were 11 subjects. Look at, look at this one. One of them actually was pretty much a horizontal line, maybe even slightly better in the low-carb situation. I'm going to come back to that. 
metabolic effects. Here's UAMPK, here's PGC1A, which is the most common uh, PGC that's researched, and that's uh, linked to mitochondrial biogenesis. In the, the high carb scenario, it's white, low carb, it's a black. So they got AMPK levels to higher um, and quicker. So this is you know somewhere between one and two hours for the low carb, but it was like between two and three hours for the high carb situation. And then here's the, the high carb and the low carb. High is white, uh, low is black. So pre-exercise, that's the PGC1A levels, which are fairly similar. But then after three hours, post-exercise, they're still fairly similar. So, but the point with the point they made with this is these high carb guys had to work for like an hour extra or whatever it was to achieve those higher PGC1A levels. But they had a little but in here. P70S6K activity. I'll tell you what that is in a minute. Here's your high carb. Here's your low carb. That's pre. There's your exercise. Afterwards, your high carb level, uh, high carb diet actually brought higher levels. So what, what is it? P70S6K via your mTOR signaling pathways created a role in protein, sorry, plays a role in protein synthesis and cell growth control via enhanced translation of certain mRNA species. Okay, so in other words, it, it um, translates or transcripts for um, muscle growth, muscle repair. So in other words, by having a low carb scenario, you're potentially stunting your back, uh, your recovery from exercise and your super compensation reactions. And it ties up before with these high cortisol levels being associated with uh, catabolism. Okay. So this is a big question mark around the low, the low carb. Sorry, I just want to sort of contemplate a sec before I go into this, this next slide. Um, Again, we're looking at very extreme scenarios. You know, these high carb guys are, you know, they're loaded with carbs all the way through and in a performance environment, absolutely, this is, this is what you want. But this is actually more looking at metabolic adaptation, which is, uh, you know, the, the aspect of the, the research. Um, with the low carb, there's problems. With the high carb, you might miss out on certain adaptations. So my question is, what about moderation? What about going back to that early black-white diagram that I shared with you? What about moderate fat, moderate carb? And this is actually going back in time again, because sometimes, you know, I'm not into just getting all the up-to-date research because sometimes all the up-to-date research is just trying to snowball current thoughts and stay in, a, stay in the same paradigm. I like to question paradigms and, and step out and look at it from a different angle. So sometimes your historical research actually is something that might have been done years ago, but nobody really paid much attention and you know they moved on with their same paradigm so this this is interesting the effects of dietary fat and exercise endurance exercise on plasma uh, cortisol prostaglandin e2 into interfere on gamma and lipid peroxides in runners okay Data from the present study suggests that higher levels of fat in the diet, and at that stage, the 40% of fat in the diet was the high fat diet compared to the lower one was 15, it was 15, 30, and 40% fats. Increases endurance running time without adverse effects on cortisol, uh, interfere on gamma and lipid peroxide levels. So that's interesting. 40%, so I went through nutritional therapy training, 
the dietetic norm was 40 is a wee bit high, maybe more like 30 would be better, uh, and your carbohydrates should be 50, maybe 60%. Going through nutritional therapy, you learn that mm, we're probably consuming a bit too much carb in general, so let's down-tune that and bring the fats and proteins up a bit. 40% for us is not out of the normal ballpark. And sometimes I've even, you know, just intuitively changed the diet for somebody and, um, and then I analyzed it afterwards and it's been sent at 40% fat. But when I look at it intuitively, it's a very healthy diet. Okay. So what about moderation? Could be 40% for some, 30% for others, bring in some genetics. It could have a, have an effect. Okay. Just a thought as well. This is a phrase that I learned in the 1990s, fat burns in a carbohydrate flame. Have we forgotten about it? Is it a pathway that was, we thought we knew, but now we know better? You know, that, that's a question mark for me, okay? Right, so I just wanna go into individuality, individuality and I, I realize I'm, Twittering on a bit as uh, so the time's going on. So I'll kind of pace through it fairly quickly just to get my point over. Um, this is a study I've shared lots and lots of times. It was done at UCT, University of Cape Town. Uh, it's Tim Noakes' lab. 2006, they did a high fat versus a high carb cycling scenario. It was a 100 kilometer time trial. And the time in minutes, obviously you want the lower time uh, better. For most of the studies, it's a downhill from high fat to low carb, meaning that the people who were, when they did the high fat diet, they went sore than when they were doing the high carb diet. But there's two outliers in this uh, sketch. So the, the conclusion from the um, researchers was that high carb is better. But when I looked at the tables and the diagrams and stuff, I saw this. And I was thinking, well, wait a minute. Yes, for six of them, it was. But for two of them, actually, the high fat was better. And this is the same lab one year before. Variability in exercise capacity and metabolic response during ex uh, endurance exercise after a low-carb diet. Quotation, the effect is highly variable between individuals and independent of changes in carb oxidation. Okay, so they're already one year before saying that people uh, respond differently. So let's go into the genetics a bit. And this is old genetic stuff. Uh, I tried to find genetics looking at um, the effect of high fat or high carb preference in individuals in sport. <laughs> and all I found was a, a maximal effort trial in obese women. And I think it was Brazil. Um, so not the subject group I really wanted, but it was all I could find. After the VO2max trial, the GLU27 group, which is one of the variants of the adrenal beta-2 adrenergic receptors, had a significantly higher respiratory exchange ratio than the GLU27 group, suggesting a lower post-exercise fat oxidation. Okay, so genetic variation in fat oxidation after or during exercise. Here's another one, and not genetic, but maximum fat oxidation occurred at average 52, at 54% maximum oxygen uptake. However, the great variability in response between individuals would preclude the prediction of the fat burning zone and the maximum fat oxidation, indicating a need for measurement in the laboratory. So they found a big variation between, uh, between people. Right, and I just want to finish this section with Alex Ferretti. I've mentioned him before. He went, uh, he went on a, um, a big passionate drive to learn more about the ketogenic approach. A couple of years ago, he tried himself as a guinea pig and some, some uh, athletes and wrote about it in FSN magazine in 2016. A year later, he had done some research and was starting to say, well, mm, actually, we're not all responding the same way. And he started looking at genes that were related to individual, 
individuality around fat metabolism. The current status is in obesity genetics, there is a ton of information on who does better on a low carb diet or a low fat diet or whatever, and other genes involved in obesity. But when it comes into sport, the preference, there's hardly anything been done, as you can see. Um, but I will go back to the base of that pyramid and say, well, what do people do on a normal daily basis and what kind of diet do they prefer? Is it black, white, center, left of center, right of center? So individualize for that person. Okay, and then we need to be thinking beyond macros. It's not just carbs, fats, proteins. What about our macros? What about our phytos? What about our antioxidants? Okay, so this might look familiar. It's very much the same pathway as I just showed you from that uh, train low, compete high study. Um, or re it was actually a re review article. Here is PGC1A. There's your MPK. This is the sirtuin gene, which is linked to aging. Okay, so PGC1A activation is uh, favorable for aging. So if we can actually express that through intermittent fasting or something, we could actually age better. Um, but as I say, not if we stress ourselves by doing uh, by using that process. So let's look into some nutrients that link into this driver of mitochondrial biogenesis. We've got L-arginine, alpha-ketoglutarate, whey protein that drives nitric oxide, resveratrol, quercetin, and this one I can never pronounce, uh, which are all antioxidants driving the sirtuin genes. And then you get lipoic acid and biotin driving the MPK. Um, now, why use arginine? I like this thing because we're in the era of beetroot research now and beetroot con contains nitrates and is vasodilating. So don't you think beetroot would actually have an effect? So it's not just about fasting and calorie restriction or low carb that activates these good transcription factors. It's about eating good food. And don't you think beetroot's got a few antioxidants in there as well? Mm. Just look at the color of it. Then we've got our old favorites. We've got a couple of exercise physiologists in the audience tonight. So, hey, I'll get you to recite this for me. This is Mikardo Catch and Catch's version. This is uh, a book by Lord and Braley, who uh, it's a laboratory evaluation technique. So in functional medicine and nutritional therapy, we identified all these nutrients associated with the Krebs cycle. It's not just your macros. Yes, your macros supply the top of the chain, but if you don't turn it around, if the cycle doesn't turn around, it doesn't matter how many carbs you eat. Where does B vitamins, magnesium, manganese, cysteine come from? Green leafy veg is quite a good start. It's not just eating lots of bread because, uh, you know, that's carbs. But that's the way I used to think, you know, coming through my undergrad and postgrad studies and, you know, sports dietetics. Boy, I used to eat a lot of bread uh, as an endurance athlete. But I didn't have enough focus on the quality. I didn't have enough focus on the, on the nutrients. And that was a big part of my presentation last time. And then you've got, this is the lab in Devon which does some really funky mitochondrial tests. So it'll test ATP levels, ATP, sorry, ADP, ATP conversion, ATP getting out of the mitochondria into the cytosol of the cell, ADP getting back into the mitochondria. If you don't do that well enough, you're not going to have enough energy. And it's not to do with your carbs or your proteins or your fats. The mitochondrial membrane is very susceptible to damage. So oxidative stress is a massive one, okay? So, and, and inflammation. So if your IL-6, IL-1, your TNF-alpha is up, um, you're gonna have more inflammation in your mitochondria because you're trying to do a, a restrictive diet, okay? Do you get the point? We need to be thinking beyond just our macros. Here's a very sophi sophisticated um, 
slide by Alex Vasquez in the States. I won't bore you with it. You can, um, you can get the slides. Someone will send you the slides tomorrow. Uh, so you can have a look at it in your leisure. I've even got his paper around this and it's fascinating. But we're talking about NF kappa B, which is a nuclear transcription factor of inflammation. All of these factors affect it. Okay, one of these factors is your macronutrient balance, but this is talking more in a health way that you're eating too much sugar and refined carbs and so on. Okay, and you're not balancing your blood sugars. Viruses, bacteria, lipid peroxidation, injuries, oxidative stress, radiation, stress, general. Rachidonic acid, which is from the omega-3, omega-6 pathways. Nutrient poor processed food with insufficient phytonutrient nutrients, antioxidants, alpha-lipoic acid, EPA, DHA, GLA. These come from oils. What about our oils? Are these high-fat diets really deliberately kind of focusing on the oils? Or is it more just on the gen generality of fat? We need to look specific and break it down a bit. So here's a table that I use quite a lot looking at Different aspects of uh, inflammation. This is the arachidonic acid cascade, which comes out of the base of the omega-6 pathway. So it's the imbalance of omega-6 uh, fatty acids that creates that. These are all dietary factors that can, what we call modulate the cascade. You don't want to block it. That's what non-steroidal anti-inflammatories do. Um, but you want to modulate it and just calm it down. And here's things that modulate NF-kappa-B transcription. Again, inflammation is a normal process. When we exercise, we want a certain amount of inflammation to create the supercompensation response, but not too much. Okay, and include, and the, in conclusion of fats versus carbs, consider the whole physiology and please, please, please don't be an extremist. Look at the subtlety of the subject. If it's just focusing on carbs, hey, you're missing some stuff. If you're just focusing on fat, hey, you're missing some stuff. Look at everything. We have the metabolic machinery to deal with all three macros very well. We've got the metabolic machinery that requires all these micronutrients. And we fundamentally live in synergy with plants. So we need the whole, okay? The whole, not the part. Okay, guys, I've waffled enough. I'm just gonna, some of you were with me last time, so I'm just gonna um, quickly run through the certificate and give you an update. Uh, just a reminder of the team is Simone, who's listening in. She's, um, she's a researcher. She's helping administratively. She's brilliant on Facebook. She's uh, kind of the person you interact with when you, uh, when you approach us. Rachel's my wife. Um, it's hard to pull her away from South Africa, but I'm going to get her on webinars. And she's phenomenal in the kitchen and talking about that quality. That's what she focuses on. When she's on our soapbox, uh, you'll, you'll listen. Dr. Hannah Moyer is one of the best lecturers I've heard. She's very, she get very good biochemical knowledge. So these AMPKs and PGC1As and all this stuff I've been talking about today, she can map that information out across lots of different systems. So she's on the course talking about exercise immunology and other uh, very fascinating subjects. Okay. It's a three module course, five days per module. First one starts in under a month. So uh, I'm working like crazy at the moment, creating lectures and trying to finish off certifications and stuff like that. And the first module is about integrative nutrition for sporting health, kind of functional medicine and sport. You know, it's creating that, that base. Um, it's, it's, the way, it's the way nutritional therapists work, but it's got a very heavy sporting element. So even if you're a nutritional therapist, you'll, you'll still take a lot away from that module. Module two is performance nutrition. So tonight was kind of a flavor of that, but of course 
I put the word applied because I never take things just straight. Okay, yes, let's all eat carbs. Oh, sorry, uh, I was wrong. Let's eat fat. Um, I challenge, and, and that's going to be heavily through that module. And then the final one is specialized. So I'm, I'm picking, there's a lot of guest uh, lecturers in that one. Uh, so they're going to have a, a big input. Okay, we've got Pete. He's, he's bringing functional medicine in in the first uh, module uh, with a live consultation. So on Facebook, pretty soon we're going to be looking for a, uh, a, a client for Pete. Alex, you'll be talking about the ketogenic stuff I talked about tonight, individuality, and also his monitoring um, strategies for athletes, which are really interesting. And Hannah, I've mentioned. Andy Blow, he's a, we just did a podcast with him, so go on the website and find his podcast, expert on uh, hydration and electrolytes. Chris is at Kingston University. He's an extreme you know, ultra distance uh, athlete and researcher. So he's going to do some exercise physiology and in module three, he'll be going more into um, extreme events. Um, okay, right, we've got a question. Can I, can I, I'll just finish this bit off and then I'll come straight back to your question. Is that okay? Um, so I'm not sort of cutting back and forth. I'll just sort of finish this bit. Okay, then we get Big Paul. He's a master's bodybuilder. He's a man with a huge amount of re, uh, experience in uh, working with individuals for anabolic gain. And then Craig Lewis is a colleague of mine from South Africa, now living uh, near London. He works a lot with footballers. His specialty is recovery. We've got Ryrie, who is a nutritional therapist working in sports. She's got a lot. She used to work for Genova Labs, so she's got a lot of functional testing knowledge. And she's going to go into micronutrients in Module 2 and a webinar on functional testing. We've got Zach here in uh, South Africa as well. We did a podcast with him. Um, he's an amazing mind. He's an exercise, exercise physiologist. He will challenge you with a podcast, with a webinar. And then I've got about three more um, lecturers to confirm, but that, they'll get lined up very, very soon. I just need a moment to, to do that. Module one, I'll let you, as I say, you'll get all these slides, so you can just uh, read through in your own time. So it's more the basis of the functionality. This is more um, exercise, Nutrition and practice. Module three is specialty. Sorry, I haven't up updated this mod, uh, this slide. Uh, I've now got names for most of these these things. But if you look on the website under CISN course tab, you'll see everything about the course. We've also got a um, course handbook finished now, so we're going to get that loaded on the um, on the on the website, but also, yeah, Simone, could you maybe just uh, email it to everyone when you, when you send out the slides as well? Okay, other stuff, we're gonna do modules, uh, sorry, webinars before the modules, webinars after. Uh, we've just set up a closed Facebook group for people on the course. Uh, to help with study, to help with discussion. They can basically ask any questions of each other and of us, of myself and Simone. And, uh, and the lecturers, you know, so once you've uh, seen a lecturer present, you can, you can get, uh, get in and get access to them. Okay, we're certified by BASES, so that's exciting. So it's more access to sports scientists. And that's really an area that, that was my original training. So it's an area I'm quite passionate about sharing within. Uh, we should hear any time about this uh, Nutritional Therapy Education Commission, which is a short course certification. And so it's not about to start. It's they're having their board meeting tomorrow. So we should hear shortly. Uh, and BANT. So we've got the BANT CPDs, which uh, will uh, make nutritional therapists very happy. 
but the the NTEC thing is uh, is the bigger aspect. How much total cost is two two nine nine, but I've extended the early bird quite a lot because um, I want this is the first year. I'm being more flexible with prices. I want to get people in. Um, I want to get it rolling. Okay, so I think the the original price is fair, but I'm trying to get people rolling through the course. So I'm being very fair. Um, online price is one nine 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 nine, but there are discounts. You can do a, a six month payment plan, so um, just a little bit extra, but you can spread it out. And I can even do longer payment plans if that suits you. And then discounts, basis members, band members, uh, and people, if you refer, refer a friend, there's a 10% discount. Okay. Additionally, I'm hosting the ICANN conference in early June, which is just a few days before module two. Um, if you register before the March, end of March, I'm going to give you a free place on that. Okay, so that's the deal with Target. All right, there's the details. So send us an email. Well, you've got the website here, so just go onto the contact page to send an email. But you'll get an email from Simone tomorrow with the slides and the the module handbook. Okay, right. Questions. So we've got one already. So Anyone else, you feel free to just start firing. Um, okay. So nutrition should be personalized and there should be cycliza cyclization, it's a difficult to pronounce word, from one high fat week to the opposite high carb one, matching training and arriving at competition with optimal macros for competition. How can, uh, how can, made this in compatible time? I mean, is it better to use software or any other templates? Can you give suggestions or practical examples? Okay, what you're asking here is very much the James Morton work. So if you send me an email, I'll, I'll send you a couple of papers. Um, yes, you can basically do low fat building up and then change it for c competition. Um, the way they do it in research is, yeah, very specific through, through computer programs. The way I work in practice is to visualize it. I know what a carb is in, I know what a fat is in. I, I can personalize a diet and make it very healthy um, and skew it towards low carb or skew it towards higher carb. And I know how to, to load. Uh, load carbohydrates. So that depends on your experience and your preference. Um, Alex Ferretti is a kind of geek with his gadgets, so he would want all the specific numbers. I personally, um, I'll use experience to create a diet for an athlete, which I feel is better than one created by a computer program, but I'll sometimes use the software to back up what I've uh, just done. Um, something I'll say about the the current research, and it's called carbohydrate periodization, and and someone wrote a, was it a blog or an article on that recently. So I think it's really really interesting, and as uh, you say, theory is amazing. Um, but I have to remind you that he's working with the best athletes in the world. He's working specific, specifically with tour cyclists who will ride for three weeks straight uh, on the bike, sometimes for five hours at a time per day. So the strategies would be different from even like a marathon runner. I used to think that a marathon was a long way, but you know the top marathons are you know, two and a bit hours now metabolically that is very very different from uh, from cycling and would i use fat loading or low carb strategies for a marathon runner i'd probably want to actually see their genetics and, and make a call from that and and use my judgment i ask questions in my my practice around what you know how do you 
how do you do with different diets and what do you need before a training session and how long can you go between meals before you start getting a blood sugar dip? You know, things like that. It's all around blood sugar. And I, I can actually assess that, uh, you know, reasonably well. So, uh, so yeah, understand this as elite athletes. If you're working like me, the majority of your clients being people who work and train on the side and their cortisol levels are high all day long, we need to think a little bit differently. We don't want to stress their body. So that's why I brought out that slide of moderation. Because, yeah, they might be on a low-carb diet, but it's actually Mediterranean applied with a drop in carb. And that's something I do a lot. But the full-on banting or ketogenic, I don't do very much. Okay. Um, okay. So, how to make it in practice? Yeah, you. James has all those theories, and it, it's a very precise science. So, you can actually look at his. He's got um, so sort of weekly plans of, you know, how many days prior to the race and uh, and around training and so on around endurance session versus short sessions and hard sessions and how you should be loading. So an example is if you've just done, done a high intensity session this morning, make sure you get enough carbohydrate to glycogen replenish, say up to lunchtime. But then if tomorrow morning you're just doing an easy uh, recovery ride or a so steady, steady ride, uh, just to put the miles in, have a low carb dinner, a low carb breakfast, or or even fasting, and then go for your ride. But then, hey, the next day you're doing high intensity again. So later in that day, you'd bring the carbs up. So that's the kind of way he does it. Okay, it can't take three hours to plan a complicated diet for just one person. The price would be prohibitive. Okay, that's exactly my point of view. So. Um, so yeah, I, I work intuitively a lot, but also if you were to do that, you'd be like, okay, one hour with a client or an hour and a half with a client, then you now have to spend an hour, maybe two hours creating a diet for them and you have to build them for three hours rather than one. So that, that is a point. Um, so there's a difference between research laboratory we have the resources to spend the time creating this information and actually as a practitioner yourself where you've got clients booked in every hour, it's a different, it's a different ball game. Um, what you can do is you can have somebody or you have office days where you do the, um, you do the software work, um, but you have to bill extra to the client and some clients won't want that. Um, so it's a consideration. Okay, I, I sometimes send uh, these jobs to Simone who has the software and she'll come back with a report for a, for a client for me because I, yeah, I don't enjoy that side of it so much. Okay, guys, any other questions before we finish? I've rabbited on quite a while now. Um, software templates, um, I'm gonna pass that to Simone. Um, Simone can give you a drop you an email tomorrow. Let me just uh, put a, a note. Okay, there's ones I've used, but you know they're they're not brilliant, and I haven't really kept up to, up to speed with it. Okay, anything else, guys? All right, thank you. And thank you and good night. And I'm going to go and sit and have a nice little Scottish whiskey. Um, and I will hopefully see you at the next webinar, which is only three weeks away, because four weeks away, we're suddenly in the middle of the course. And hopefully some of you can make it to the course either in, Lo in London or, or online. I welcome all of you. Okay, guys, good night. And thanks a lot for giving up an hour and 20 minutes of your time.